Okay, could you please start by saying your name and spelling your name for us? My name is Chris Buckley. That's C-H-R-I-S-B-U-C-K-L-E-Y. Okay, and today is Tuesday, June 19th, 2018, and we're at Red Oak Brewery in Whitsett, North Carolina. I'm Richard Cox, talking today with Chris Buckley, brewmaster, as part of the Wellcrafted NC project. So can we start? If we start, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, I was born and raised in Germany, spent about 25 years over there, uh, eight of those in Munich, mm -hmm. which some people would call the capital of the beer world, but arguably, of course, but uh, I'm a German trained brewer, uh, started my career back in 1995, um, did a formal apprenticeship uh, while working for the Paul Honor Brewery in Munich. Um, graduated in January of 1998 from that program. I ended up spending five years with Paul Honor um, as a brewer and maltster before uh, going to the United States to, to pursue my brewing career. Oh, awesome. So you got started brewing while you were in Munich. Yes. So how was that? How does that differ from, well, I guess when you got started here? Well, the program that I, that I was enrolled in was is a very old program, mm -hmm. and uh, you know I had several generations of brewers and brewmasters uh, to to talk to, to to pick their their brains on different processes, and you know as technology changed, I was able to uh, ask them, you know how how was it made before we had filters, before we had pasteurization of the beer, mm -hmm. and so I learned a lot of things that I you know I think be really hard to, to find in some of the uh, stateside schools. Um, mm -hmm. The brewery, uh, Paul Honor, opened up in 1634. I was working in a oh, really, wow. really old uh, yeah. brewery. It was so, an awesome experience. That sounds awesome. So you were, you've been knee deep in the Bavarian purity law since you started. That's right. Yeah. As a matter of fact, as part of the graduation process, mm -hmm. the mayor of Munich handed out silver coins uh, that had the Munich purity law, oh, okay. which is older than the Bavarian purity law. Oh. The Munich purity law is from 1489, and we all had to take an oath uh, that we would adhere to the uh, Munich purity law of, of 1489. So pretty amazing yeah. um, uh, time over there, and I've been able to, to you know, uh, pro basically process and, uh, and do this here in the United States. So what are the differences between the Munich and Bavarian purity laws? It is the exact same. One okay. just outdates the other, but <laughs> they, both, they both called for only three ingredients. Right. Malted barley, water, and hops. Right. Uh, the yeast was more or less the first amendment to the document once we realized that that was an ingredient. <laughs> okay. And so you, once you got over to the U.S., what, started, what happened with your career then? And so uh, as part of what I was doing at Paul Honor, uh, such an old brewery, I ended up working in the cellars, um, over 250 feet in the ground. The hardest job in the brewery because we didn't have technology to know how full the tanks were getting. I was receiving beer from another department and uh, we had to use our wrenches to tap on the outside of the tanks in order to determine the level. So it sounds Extremely tough. cold, uh, loud environment. So I just put an ad out there in the American Brewer magazine, which I don't even think exists anymore. Classified ad, just testing the waters. Sure. And uh, at the time, a German company by the name of Baraplan, just outside of Munich, had sold a brewery uh, in Northern Virginia, um, and they were looking for somebody who could, who could run it. Mm -hmm. They happened to read the ad and uh, ended up taking the job in, in Virginia at the Birchmere Brewery. Uh, in in uh, 1990, the end of 1998, uh, ran that from 98 through uh, October of 2003. So that was the first uh, five years where I, mm -hmm. I was in charge of running a brewery. Where at Paul Honor, I was a cog in the wheel. There were right. 78 brewmasters there. So when you clocked out at the end of your day, you didn't take your work with you. No, you know, not like it is when you're running a small craft brewery like like I am today right exactly so what resources have you drawn on to help you grow as a brewer um, I mean a lot of times just going back to the textbooks right. uh, we had to keep a journal every day as part of the apprenticeship and that journal was filled with lots of information sure. and sometimes I remember having asked a question on a certain topic not exactly remembering the answer so I'll go back and try and find that journal entry and so that that's been huge 
still keep in contact with some of the workers in Paul Honor in Munich, my mentor um, as well. So Great. always drawn back on those resources as much as possible. So can you talk about any particular people you would consider to be a mentor or you have had a major impact on your career? Number one was Andreas Höflinger. That's H-O-E-F-L-I-N-G-E-R to spell it. Uh, he's in charge of the filtration department at the Paul Honor Brewery in Munich. Ironic, we don't filter the beer here at Red Oak, right. but he's an expert in all things beer, and I've often found myself going back to him with questions uh, that you know I knew I would get the, the best professional answer out there from. Sure. And so you started work at Red Oak in October of 2003. So what was it like here, or it wasn't even here actually, so what was it like at Red Oak when, yeah. you, when you arrived? Well, correction, I started in March of 2004, March. so there was oh, okay. a gap in there between the Virginia and, uh, and North Carolina. Okay. Um, yeah, March of 2004 was when I started, and uh, well, I'm sure, sorry, what was the question? So what was it like at Red Oak what when you were like? Yeah. We all sat around a very small table. Uh, mm -hmm. There were eight of us at the, at the quarterly meetings, and a very, very small operation. Mm -hmm. uh, we were doing 10 barrel batches at the time, and we were averaging 14 barrel, ba uh, 14 10 barrel batches a week, because we had so many outside accounts at the time mm -hmm. that uh, that little system was having a hard time keeping up. So, how large is the system now, for comparison? Sake? System now is uh, 42 and a half barrels, 50 hectoliters. Okay. Yep. Our our old system is in the Red Oak Lager House on display in the gift shop. Oh, very cool. Some people think we're actually brewing beer out of those vessels, but. <laughs> It's I'm just a just a display <laughs> right now. So for people unaware of Red Oak and what it is, how would you describe Red Oak? The brewery or the beer? Let's do both. The both. Go for it. That's uh, the brewery. We uh, we currently have a, a, a you know a state of the art system in order mm -hmm. to produce very consistent beers, um, but we use a very traditional approach to beer making. Despite mm -hmm. all the automation, we're really, we're just using four ingredients to create uh, currently seven different recipes. Um, we do not filter the beer. We don't pasteurize the beer. So it's beer the way it used to be made. 100 years ago, this was nothing special. Today, that the fact that you don't filter, you don't pasteurize beer makes it really special. Mm -hmm. um, the, cur the current uh, purity law allows both filtration and pasteurization. So we've taken it one step. We're, we're doing it the way it was in 15, 16, except right. we have hard drives uh, controlling the timing and the mm -hmm. temperatures, all the consistent uh, features uh, of brewing are, are, uh, are automated. Great. And you all, you all specialize as lagers, correct? That's right. Which is a little unusual in the area. We just do the lagers. Mm -hmm. Uh, much larger capital investment because right. of the residency time per batch uh, in a tank um, where you can crank out a really good ale in less than 10 days where a lager is going to take anywhere between one to two months mm -hmm. uh, because you're fermenting at much colder temperatures. If you fermented a lager at an ale temperature, it would be done in three to 10 days as well, but the flavor would be awful because that lager yeast secretes some very foul tasting byproducts at ale fermentation temperatures where the ale yeast secretes those delicious ale esters uh, into the beer. Right. So lagers are a little bit trickier, they're less forgiving. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen a lot of recent articles uh, in craft magazines uh, where they're talking about the rise of lagers. A lot of these brewers are, are starting to roll out um, uh, lager beers. Um, I think a lot of it is just the industry catching up because mm -hmm. many people were self-taught when they got into the industry and uh, the IPA is just simply the easiest uh, beer to make well. Um, it's very forgiving uh, beer style, where the lager is the exact opposite, very unforgiving. Any, any flaws are immediately noticeable uh, in the final product. So, right. so um, we touched on this briefly, but how has Red Oak changed since you first began working here? I mean, it seems like there's been a lot that's happened. A lot has happened. We have over 40 employees, uh, so you know that's five times when I, the eight that when I when I first started here. Mm -hmm. um, we're, br we're brewing. Uh, our batch size is four times as well. Our distribution has 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 changed quite a bit. When I first started, uh, we sold beer in Charlotte. We sold beer in, in the Triad and in the Triangle, Raleigh, Durham, 
Mm -hmm. uh, and that was it. Uh, we're currently uh, up, all up and down the coast. We took a quick look at the Outer Banks and figured that just wasn't worth the drive at, the, at this time. Right. But you know, all up and down the coast, we're very strong presence now. Um, we're moving one of the reps uh, out west. He's, he's going to oh. be setting up shop in Lenore mm -hmm. and focusing on that market, including Boone. We're, mm -hmm. we're stopping short of Asheville at the moment. Part of that has to do with the current 25,000 barrel cap that we'll talk about. Sure. But, so our footprint has dramatically increased. Mm -hmm. uh, probably one of the biggest changes since I started were in bottles. Okay. When I first started, Bill Sherrill, the owner of Red Oak, was in interviews being quoted as, you can't bottle Red Oak because it's not filtered nor pasteurized. And I had to start, start telling them, don't tell them that, Bill, because <laughs> once we bottle, they're going to question how we did it. And, you know, we did have some early comments when we first bottled that. Mm -hmm. You know, it's sad to see that they're, that they're filtering and pasteurizing in order to put it in the bottle. So we had to start a real strong campaign immediately saying, no, no, we're not. It's the exact same beer uh, mm -hmm. in the bottle. And, uh, so yeah, that, that's probably been the biggest change, being on the grocery store shelf, right? Which is is is, is huge for it us is. as far as growth. Mm -hmm. And so Rayo began as Spring Garden Brewing Company in 1991 in Greensboro. Um, I think it might have been when it might have existed earlier, but I think that's when they were the beer. Um, before moving to Witsit in 2007, what prompted the move out of Greensboro? Simply, we ran out of room. We ran out of room. There was there was more property that Bill could have developed out there, but it just wasn't suitable. And then logistically, our drivers would leave the exit at, at uh, Guilford College Road, and it's still almost uh, 10 minutes to get to the brewery. So that's 20 minutes of their day just getting on the on and off the highway. We're here, right. we're we're right on the exit entrance ramp. So real convenient to hit the Charlotte and Raleigh in the mornings and, and coming back in the afternoon. Yeah. So. You mentioned the uh, barrel cap earlier, so let's talk about um, Red Oak has been an outspoken advocate of changing legislative restrictions on the brewing industry. Um, can you talk a little bit about the legislative changes you faced throughout the years, as well as some of the ongoing um, legislative impediments? Yes. Uh, we have to probably start with uh, Oli Benowitz, Weeping Radish. He gets credit for being the one to, to get the ball rolling. Uh, when he started his Weeping Radish Brewery, at first he was just selling in-house like most do, and then he started getting local restaurants in town mm -hmm. and say, hey, I'd love to carry your beer. But then he found out legally he couldn't make it work. So he did go to Raleigh and he got, he got some self-distribution. Don't quote me on this one. I believe it was a thousand barrels a year is mm -hmm. what, it, what it initially was. And uh, when I started working for Red Oak in 2004, the cap was 10,000 barrels a year. Wow. And Bill was, was at that time carrying the torch trying to get it raised. Uh, the bill that um, did pass initially uh, was written for 60,000 barrels of annual production. In the last minute, they, they put a, a, a stroke through that and wrote in 25,000 barrels and passed it. Mm -hmm. That's where we are today. Right. Over 14 years later, we're still stuck at that 25. If it hadn't moved from the 10, we wouldn't be sitting here today because it would not have made sense to build the new brewery out here in Witsit. We'd still be operating out of the brew pub at 10,000 barrels a year. Mm -hmm. So that just goes to show how many jobs that alone already created, being able to, to build the bigger brewery, to, 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 to build our lager house and our art galleries going up now. And if the state gives us the op opportunity, we're gonna continue to grow because we are adamant to stay under the 25,000 barrel uh, production uh, until this law eventually will change. And you are probably pretty close to that too. We're think. getting close. We're making many business decisions to make sure we do stay under. Right. Uh, not a day goes by where people aren't asking for all of our seasonals in the bottle. Well, that extra volume could get us there. Right. Why are we not trying to, to, to go into the Asheville market at this time? Again, it's a volume issue. This is based on production numbers. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not based on beer sold. And so um, we could easily get to that 25,000 barrels if we're not careful. Right, exactly. So that gets into um, so the, the current craft freedom movement, right? Yes. Which is currently moved into a lawsuit mode. Um, and if you want to talk about how it got to that point. Yes, when House Bill 500, uh, which was, was on the floor in uh, 2017 with great bipartisan support, when that failed due to the you know the, the lobbying efforts mm -hmm. of the beer wholesalers uh, it became evident that this was politically was probably not ever going to change uh, 
at all. Mm -hmm. And so Craft Freedom, under the leadership of John Marino and uh, Tom Ford with uh, old Mecklenburg and Noda Brewing, uh, uh, decided, decided to challenge it on legal grounds. And the case at this very moment is looking great. Mm -hmm. Not, you know, interesting to see what comes of it, but it looks very promising. The, the judge did not dismiss it. The state asked to dismiss the case. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's pretty interesting to think about. That's how scared they are about all the investigation that's going on right now. A lot of things, a lot of subpoenas have been issued, and already a lot of information has been uncovered. It looks like the tip of the iceberg as far as all of the illegal activity that's happening. Okay. Um, to put things in a nutshell, what the state is saying to one privately owned company like Old Mech, Noda, Red Oak, Raleigh, Raleigh Brewing, you have to give up your business to another privately owned company. Mm -hmm. And that's what this is all about. Right. Um, and so hopefully, hopefully this is going to change okay. um, in, the, in the very near future. Right. So Red Oak just opened the Lager House Beer Garden in 2017 as the first part of a multi-phase 28,000 square foot addition. So what all is going on here and what is the larger vision for the Lager House and other public spaces and going forward? Excellent question. Well, we've already run out of parking here at the Lager House, so we're having to add more parking spaces. And with that, we have to put another retention pond on the property, which uh -huh. takes us to about a million dollars worth of retention ponds on the, on the, on the property. But that's, those are the rules. Um, next, the art gallery is going up. It's an art museum. Uh, I wish Bill was here to talk about it a little bit. He is addicted to collecting art. If there's a, a club for that, he should be their, their president. <laughs> Uh, he literally has hundreds of, of paintings in storage all, all up and down the, the brewery in his office and every available corner to lean a painting up there's one there uh, we are that, that's going up um, right now and probably looking at at least four months of construction um, to get that going uh, we also have an extension to the brewery taking place right now we've added um, a packaging hall where we'll eventually be able to relocate our current packaging operation and add a few more machines to it to make it more efficient. And we're adding on 2,000 square feet of walk-in cooler space that we're immediately going to utilize as soon as they fire up the refrigeration, which I'm being told will be uh, mid-July of this year. We're really looking forward to that. Uh, we are very tight on, on cooling space at the brewery at the moment. Okay. Right. So how do you see Red Oak growing in the future, Mike? I see it mainly um, just the way it's, it's been. We've never been logarithmic as far as growth goes. We've always taken baby steps cautiously, expanding into a new territory. You know, never say never on going out of state, but I think we still have a lot of sales, that potential sales right here at home. Mm -hmm. And so we don't really see the need for doing that. Uh, the Lager House and Beer Garden are a big part of the future. If you look at the current trends, uh, the tasting rooms are the, are the ones uh, get, getting the people now. Mm -hmm. The sports bars are, are, are suffering. A lot of the chain restaurants are suffering at this time, and all the statistics are showing that the tasting rooms are, are where the people are going out. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, perfect timing for us, because yeah. we're even seeing internally in some of our outside accounts, we're seeing the sales are down. In some cases, if they were doing two kegs a week, they're down to one. Not that they're drinking less Red Oak, there's less people filling the seats there these days. All right. So, um, what would you say is your favorite beer from a North Carolina brewery other than your own? That's a really hard question. There's some it good is. examples out there. I probably would have to pick the Foothills Torch Pilsner. Torch. Okay. Being a lager guy, um, that's a really good example of a Pilsner beer. Great. And this, this is probably an obvious one, but what would you say is Red Oak's flagship or signature beer? It is Red Oak. <laughs> yeah, Red Oak. And people, especially at the beer festivals, they come up and just say, just give me the classic or give me the traditional one. And uh, it is definitely the Red Oak. 80% yeah. 80 of our sales in, in 2017 still. Red Oak. So that proves it right there. Mm -hmm. And what would you say is your favorite beer from Red Oak? It would have to be the Red Oak. Red Oak is Yeah. And of the seasonals, it would be the Old Oak, which is our Oktoberfest style beer. Mm -hmm. But the Red Oak is just the all around beer. Awesome. Uh, it's, it's a hard one where we get a lot of accounts asking us for food pairing recommendations. And mm. 
It's a pretty simple que uh, answer to that question. Red Oak is good with everything, it and is. it is. It's not one of those beers where you, know, you might need you know, a dessert with it or something really spicy. I think Red Oak really pairs well with, with all the foods out there. Awesome, great. Is there anything else you'd like to add? No, I think that sums it up right there. Great. Um, there's a good future ahead for everyone at Red Oak. I think so. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank, thank you for your you. time. Thanks, Richard.